Good evening. I now call to order the February 26, 2024 meeting of the Bend School District Board of School Directors. You know, I'll please rise and follow me in the Pledge of Allegiance. 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 Pledge of Allegiance.
Please direct your comments to the chair. Be respectful, not engage in profane rhetoric, and be mindful that others, including students, may be listening. I would request that you consider that protocol when making your comments. For the members of the audience, please also be respectful and refrain from speaking during the public comment period. With that, I will now e announce each person's name and their topic. Uh, when you step up to the podium, again, state your name, and you'll have three minutes within which to speak, and I will give you a 30-second warning when your time is going to be up. Okay. Our first speaker tonight is Haley Hochstrasser, I hope I pronounced that correctly, uh, to talk about ASL New Class. We're together, if that's okay. You ready? As rising freshmen, it has been one, a wonderful experience to look at the EHS program of studies for the first time. Reading about the offerings in every department is overwhelming, but in the best possible way. We both look forward to the amazing opportunities at our high school has to offer. While the, cor while the course offerings at Emmaus High School are dynamic, there are there, are, there is one area we would like to mention tonight where we see an opportunity to program enhance. My name is Haley. And my name is Giselle. Tonight we would like to propose the idea of the addition of ASL as a language and elective at the Emmaus High School. American Sign Language is deeply rooted in the deaf community and its culture. Learning ASL in a classroom promotes better awareness and sensitivity to hearing impaired community. Learning this intricate language allows one to develop a strong appreciation for deaf culture as well as promoting understanding and acceptance of others. As students learning, ASL would allow me to respectfully help sending deaf people at a time, enhance a college application, and even open a future job opportunity. A few facts are, today there are over a thousand public high schools nationwide that offer American Sign Language as a course. About 70 million people use sign language globally, and the, the number 13% are teenagers over the age of 12. The formal education of deaf students in the United States began in 1817 with the establishment of what is now the American School of, for the Deaf in Hartford, Connecticut. Approximately more than half a million people throughout the U.S. use ASL to communicate as their native language. ASL is the third most commonly used language in the United States after English and Spanish. We have one quote that we think that you should listen to. It is, deafness is a sensory different. It only comes with disability when the educational system fails the child and family. So we think you should take this into consideration of why we should make ASL a class. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I see, uh, Gazelle, you submitted your own form, so we actually have two, two speakers tonight. Thank you very much for your comments. Our, uh, our second topic tonight is from Shannon Naylor to talk about the facilities plan. Hello. I also have it printed out in case anybody, if I'm not very concise. Um, given the facility plans that were sent out to the district earlier this week, we feel that there's another option that hasn't been explored. We call it the realign and repurpose plan. Um, you start at the top, build a new high school, Albertus High School. The Emmaus High School becomes Emmaus Junior High School, and it will be for 7th and 8th of the entire district. The middle schools, LMMS and IR, will be 5-6 for their respective schools. Elementary schools will lose 5th grade, so they will be K-4. through four. This opens up room in all buildings for more student learning. Um, the cost is less. You only have the cost of building the high school. You save the $66 million in repairs and expansions to the middle schools. Um, you have no disruption to student learning because all of the construction will be done in one location and one location only. Therefore, students and existing facilities will not be affected. And then you have one rollout and done. That's my plan. This is more detail if you need it, if you want to look over it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you to our requesters. 
Moving on to the next item on the agenda is the approval of minutes. May I have a motion to approve the minutes from the February 12th, 2024 meeting? So moved. Second. Are there any comments or questions from the board? Seeing none, Ms. Allen, please call the roll. Ms. Bowman? Aye. Mr. Falegi? Aye. Ms. Ford? Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Klotz? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Dr. Whitney? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Nine ayes. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Uh, next is the district update. Uh, Dr. Campbell? Yes, I'd like to start off by um, honoring some of our students for their outstanding accomplishments. This month it happens, or I should say this meeting happens to be students from Emmaus High School. First, congratulations to several students who participated in the 14th annual Hope and Healing jur juried art show. Those who were recognized as award winners um, include Amelia Chiron, Ariel Bayard, Ahmad Navid, Cecilia Christ, and Kira Murphy. And C Cecilia and Kira both also earned Balm School scholarships. We'd also like to recognize and congratulate our EHS students who attend LCTI and were identified as the students of the month for the second marking period. Those students are Nadia Chrisman, Nathaniel Conrad, Olivia East, Ross Gall, Julia Jones, Shirley Lehman, Zach Lesher, Giuseppe Macaluso, Sam Malitz, Aileen Petty, Carter Roth, Adam Snyder, Jack Sullivan, Malik Walker, Jacob Walter, and Luke Yandersitz. Some reminders about upcoming events in the district is this today, actually Monday, February 26th, um, is the beginning of the online process for applying for our EHS local scholarship program. So any current seniors at Emmaus High School, I encourage them to um, take a look at the list of scholarships and there's really an amazing comprehensive list of scholarship opportunities that are available to our current seniors and they are available on our EHS counseling website. Um, applications are due by March 18th, so our high school seniors have about a three-week window to consider those scholarship opportunities and apply for some. Also, you may have noticed our signs across the district that went up today as a visual reminder that kindergarten registration for any student who turns five by September 1st can register for East Penn Kindergarten for the 24-25 school year. The registration process officially opens online on March 1st, which it's hard to believe is the end of this week already. Um, if you need any information, you could check out any of our um, school websites and or our district wide website. Simply click on kindergarten registration. You can contact one of our buildings. You can also reach out to our central registrar and we are happy to answer any questions. The online application process really is simple and we look forward to having new families and students join us. I'd also like to remind our community that the East Penn Education Foundation is hosting its annual Career Exploration Fair. That is a huge event that's held this year on Tuesday, March 26th from 6 to 8 p.m. in the Emmaus High School gym. Um, we are looking for local community members, professionals who might be willing to come in and share their career with our Emmaus students. Registration and all the information can be found on our East Penn Education website. And a final reminder that I have is, believe it or not, we're starting to plan for the end of the year already, and our East Penn Education Foundation is sponsoring a grad sign sale. Um, so for any eighth grade families and or families of seniors at Emmaus High School, we are offering grad signs for our eighth graders at Iyer and Lower McCungie Middle School, as well as grad signs for our current seniors. So please check out an opportunity to celebrate your eighth to ninth grader or senior. And finally, you may have noticed at our board meetings, we are attempting to um, showcase some of the awesome work that's happening from our students across the district. Again, tonight our focus is on Emmaus High School. And so at this point, I'd like to invite up Mrs. Gariello and some members 
of our um, our student body from Emmaus High School. This year, Mrs. Gariello and her team have begun a student mentor program. This is um, a new program at Emmaus High School that in a short amount of time has already had a tremendous impact on our students. And so I welcome Mrs. Gariello and several of our student mentors who are going to tell us a little bit about the program um, and how it has helped them and others. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Campbell. I'm not going to say much other than just introduce these awesome students. We had two other students who were slotted to attend, and, and they had other commitments. Um, so I'm going to ask the kids to take over at this point. We have Jackson, Abe, Kaya, and Sylvia here this evening. And um, if Candice or Nick come in la it, uh, through the back door, we'll slide them in too. So I'm going to turn it over to Jackson. Uh, hello, as Ms. Gariello uh, said, my name is Jackson Kreiner. Um, I'm an 11th grader, current 11th grader in Mayas High School. I'd just like to thank Dr. Campbell, Ms. Gariello, and the board for letting us speak tonight um, and describe what we do as mentors for um, a new student mentor group. Um, I'm going to go over just quick where this came from and then what we're thinking of doing in the future. So um, each month, Ms. Gariello holds a um, principal's advisory meeting that um, students from all over the school can attend. And last year, from it, uh, one of the upperclassmen was like, oh, we should have like this new student mentor thing for freshmen and new students. So we can kind of guide them through the school, guide them through what we do like as students and what it means to be a Hornet. Um, so that's what we do at these meetings. Um, and then what we're looking to do in the future, we've come across many obstacles um, throughout the year, um, which I think someone back here is going to discuss. So I won't get into them. but. Um, we we're thinking of just keeping it around, hoping that our current 11th graders who are doing it will stay around next year. The upcoming 11th graders, so current sophomores, will come up and do it. Um, we're hoping to really solidify it. We It was a program in the past, a couple years ago, but um, it kind of fell flat. So we're hoping to really keep the energy strong, keep the um, momentum going to keep this going, because it really does help. Um, and it really builds the connections within the school between the upperclassmen and the underclassmen and just unify Amaze High School as one collective unit. So yeah. So my name is Abraham Fink. I'm going to tell you guys what we've done as a leadership program and uh, what we've done to work towards where we've gotten. So Mr. Stuchko is our like main teacher that we work with. He's great. He does everything for us pretty much. Uh, we've worked with him to discuss what we're going to do with the future of this program just to make sure that what we do aligns with everybody's thinking and uh, what's going to go on in the future as well as what we plan on doing with the new students in terms of activities and what we found is best for just us as a group as well with all the student mentors. We've also worked with Katie and Abby from Tom Stecker and Associates and we've learned successful leadership techniques from them that have further bettered us in our abilities as mentors and everybody else in our group. Hello, I'm Kaya Vandersloos. Um, I'm going to be talking about our mentoring sessions and then the eighth grade parent night. During our mentoring sessions, we bring in new students and the freshmen. We start with a warm up to get them comfortable and talking, and then eventually we move on to bigger topics and activities that we practice beforehand. This gets the students engaged and comfortable with the mentors and creates an easier environment for the freshmen. At the eighth grade parent night, a few of the mentors spoke to introduce incoming freshmen and parents. We brief them about the mentoring program so they can introduce it to their students at home so that the students know what they are coming into when entering high school. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Sylvia Jennings, and I'm going to talk about where our mentor started and where we are now. So we kicked off mentoring at the beginning of the year, but due to lack of engagement and trouble getting the freshmen to be interested in what we were doing, we took a few months off where the teachers leading this program went to find outside resources to better teach us how to help these freshmen. We started back after winter break with new information on how to connect with our smaller groups. Um, and we found a lot of success in including fun aspects because honestly the freshmen didn't really care to be there. And so our main job has been to make them care and engage them in different aspects of high school. So we've found a routine where we'll do something a little heavier 
and teach them about something. And then last time we did a competition so that the freshmen are more engaged. And with this, we hope to build better connections and get our groups more engaged. Thank you. The kids really are leading this. It's a student-driven uh, program. They're developing the lessons and the activities. They, um, the leadership group meets once a month, plans two activities. They get 150, 160 mentors together in the auditorium. They practice the activities, and then they implement them. And um, it's something to see if you look at the photos on um, our social media. The kids are actually sitting in the hallway in groups. They take about six new students from each homeroom, combine two homerooms together, they sit in circles in the hallways uh, with two mentors. And um, it's an interesting dynamic because you have people walking over you when they're trying to have conversations. But these kids have really done an amazing job. And um, they're excited they, um, to continue the program and I'm really, really proud of them. So thank you for this opportunity. Thanks Mrs. Gariello and thanks to all of our student mentors who came tonight. That's all I have. Hey, thank you, Dr. Campbell. Thank you, Mrs. Gariello, and thank you, EHS students. Do we have any questions or comments from the board? I just have a comment. Sure, Ms. Ford. Uh, and I wish it had popped in my head prior to um, the student government leaving. I wanted to make sure I extended a huge thank you to the uh, Black Student Union, who has been running Black History Month um, acknowledgments on Instagram I happen to follow and to my surprise saw a picture of me um, which was surprising because you know I wasn't sure they knew who I was but I thought it was very nice to be acknowledged um, they actually have been doing uh, consistent posting and so I wanted to make sure that I shared that uh, with you Dr. Campbell to extend a huge thank you for being included and to wish them as well a happy Black History Month. Okay, thank you, Ms. Ford. Any other comments? Uh, Ms. Bowman? Well, first, well-deserved, uh, Ms. Ford. Um, I, I just wanted to, uh, I just really appreciated the presentation by the high school students. I'm really happy that we are um, doing this mentoring program. I understand that you've hit some bumps in the road and it actually, you impressed me with your ability to take on those problems and figure out uh, ways to solve them. Um, and I really hope that this program continues into the future because that transition from eighth to ninth grade is a huge one for many students and this is something that can help. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bowman. Actually, I do. Uh, Ms. Klotz. Hi, I just would also like to say I am so excited about the mentoring group. I think this will be great for our incoming students. And thank you so much. It sounds like you, you regrouped, found out what was needed, and are continuing. So good job to you guys. And also the ASL, the students who are speaking about ASL, I think that's great. And I'm very excited um, that you are so interested in that as well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Klotz. Other comments? Well, again, thank you for, for uh, sharing what's going on with the, with the mentor program. Uh, you know, I agree with what was already said here about you know, overcoming challenges. Not only are you helping students with their transition, but you're also learning some, some valuable skills on problem solving and, and engagement. So you know, just think about what your teachers have to do on a day-to-day -day basis in order to, uh, <laughs> to uh, you know, get, you, get, get students uh, excited about what they're doing in the classroom. Okay, again, thank you for that. Is it okay to clap for them? I thought yeah. it was. <laughs> All right. Uh, if there aren't any further comments, we'll move on in the agenda. Uh, next item is curriculum. Uh, there are seven items. I'm going to. We're going to go do these uh, individually. Uh, first item is educational conferences. Uh, may I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Any comments or questions from the? Okay. Seeing none, Ms. Allen, please call the roll. Mr. Falegi? Aye. Ms. Ford? Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Klotz? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Dr. Whitney? Aye. Ms. Bowman? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Nine ayes. Thank you, Ms. Allen. 
Uh, item B is a review, a second reading of the 2024-2025 school district uh, student teacher calendar. It's my understanding that there are no changes from what we saw two weeks ago. I don't know if administration has any comments that they'd like to share. There are no changes um, at the second reading of the calendar, nor has administration received any feedback from the public regarding the draft calendar. Okay, thank you, Dr. Campbell. Are there any comments or questions from the board on that? Okay, uh, then I guess the next time we'll see this will be the, the, the third viewing. Um, item C. Uh, is the, a presentation on the 2024-25 EHS targeted in school targeted support improvement plan presentation. Dr. Campbell, would you like to introduce? Yes, as our as our team transitions up to the podium, I'm I'm actually going to attempt to frame the next several items that appear under the curriculum portion of the agenda. Specifically, um, the first two relate to Emmaus High School targeted support targeted school improvement, the TSI plan. And so in just a minute, um, I'll introduce members of the school team to speak to that. And then the next item would be an action item to actually for the board to vote on the plan itself. Tonight in the presentation, you'll hear reference to um, some new curriculum that's being proposed to address needs that have been identified. And so we'll then transition into a separate curriculum presentation followed by a vote on the new curriculum. And then finally, we'll wrap up <clears throat> with um, ultimately a vote on the an addendum to the program of studies that actually incorporates the new courses that are discussed, again, multiple times. You'll sort of hear a common thread throughout the presentation. So I just wanted to outline the flow of the, um, the remainder of the curriculum items. But again, each of them will be handled individually, and we'll take time for questions after each section. Um, so just to set the stage, and I apologize if I'm duplicative of anything that our school team might be sharing in just a moment. But the community likely recalls that in January, Emmaus High School um, sent communication that we had been notified from the Pennsylvania Department of Education that Emmaus High School was identified as a targeted support and improvement school specifically for not meeting a state determines threshold, specifically or primarily, I should say, on state standardized assessments um, with our IEP student subgroups. And so one of the requirements through the Department of Education for schools that are identified in this TSI status is that our schools develop a plan to improve performance for that designated subgroup. The, the board um, may recall that we have been through this process before with Lower McCungee Middle School. We actually shared at our last meeting that um, Lower McCungee Middle School is no longer in that TSI designation. Um, and what you're going to hear tonight as we work through the targeted support and improvement plan is that um, really many of the strategies that we're talking about are about high quality instruction that can positively impact all students, not just the specific subgroup that's been identified, but some of those strategies will really target the areas of need. Over the past several weeks, a comprehensive team representing Emmaus High School that includes um, administrators, teachers, parents, um, even some students. I think Jackson Kreiner, who just spoke, was one of the students who was on that team. I think he's on every single team that we have at Emmaus High School. Um, and so, again, I just, I, I really appreciate the community's involvement and support in the development of the plan. And so at this point, I'm happy to turn things over to Ms. Scariello and Mrs. Gamble. Thank you very much. So... As Dr. Campbell said, we have been working as a team for the last six, seven weeks. Um, and I couldn't be more proud of the group of people that came together. You can see all their names, but we had representatives from the counseling department, from almost every department at the high school, administrators, community members, students. Um, and so we had input along the way. And everyone was so very serious and so committed to putting a plan together that is actionable, that helps our kids, and, um, and that we actually are excited about. This actually was, it was a, a good experience. It's a very similar process than we have had as we have had uh, in our data step back meetings, reviewing the data and talking about action steps that result after that review and analysis. So very proud of the team members. Um, they really 
did, took this very seriously and did a fantastic job. We broke down the presentation into six groups, um, an explanation of TSI, the process, data overview, discussions, what we, the discussions that we had at these meetings. The meetings were monthly for, um, for or, I'm sorry, weekly for about two hours each week. We would meet at least once a week for two hours at a time. We developed goals out of the discussions, and then obviously we'll have time for questions and feedback. So the next slide probably is familiar to a lot of people. That is just a snapshot of Emmaus High School showing our demographics. And uh, this is all state data. Um, you'll see a lot of, of screenshots and, and um, graphs and data in the presentation. I know there's a lot more information in the actual plan itself. We tried to pull out the most relevant and most important information for the presentation tonight. So TSI, there's different levels of targeted support. We are, in, um, we are in what is called TSI. There are two other levels, CTS or CSI and ATSI. TSI designation will occur for a school in which one or more student groups are identified through a process. Um, there's different tiers. So the first step is uh, they look at our achievement. And um, a TSI school will exhibit achievement at or below an annually determined level within one standard deviation of the statewide average achievement rate. So this cut score is changed, it's changed every year and it's determined at the state level. Then um, the next step, uh, the TSI designation is determined by a school that shows risk for less than expected academic growth. So it's a combination of looking at achievement and growth. Um, and then Additionally, once that is looked at, then uh, the state looks at whether or not the school falls between below statewide average performance on one or more different academic or school indicators. So all of these performance levels are higher than thresholds for CSI or additional, AT, AT, additional targeted support and improvement or ATSI. So. Um, Essentially, it's a combination score. You can see that we have the math and uh, ELA combined, and that's based on keystone scores for achievement, combination of keystone scores for growth. And then if the school is targeted, and they look at this for all subgroups, if a school's subgroup falls into these warning categories, essentially, then the state goes on and looks at other um, other information, such as graduation rate or career benchmarks or attendance, things like that. Good evening. The cycle um, of improvement is what we're following as far as the plan format for the TSI plan, um, typical to any um, process that we normally would follow. Like Dr. Campbell mentioned, in January we received the news and uh, we set the direction. We started to assess the needs and create a plan that we're putting forward tonight. Um, we hope to implement the plan for the year, monitor, and obviously adjust as we proceed. It is very typical and um, the norm that we follow as far as the data step back. The timeline itself, uh, at this point in time, the state template is not open yet. Um, it will open a little later this year. So what you have in front of you this evening, as far as the Word document, it does um, basically emulate the same sections that we will um, be putting into the system once that becomes open. So June 30th is the first possible submission date, and August 31st. Uh, is the latest possible submission date. And PDE does not approve the TSA, TSI plan, excuse me, um, but rather checks for compliance um, and does require that local school board does approve the plan. There are three sections. Um, we were kind of, we, we call it ready, set, go. So we prepared, uh, once we received the news, we started to prepare immediately. We acquired faculty volunteers to, set, uh, to sit with us as a committee, as well as um, with our administrators and counselors. We involved parents, we involved students. Um, and that, at that point, we started to uh, take a look at our needs using future ready index data, PFAS data, um, Keystone and screener information, as well as school-wide engagement data to, evalu to evaluate the needs and the root causes. And now we're in the go. So what we did is we analyzed that, all the strengths and all the concerns as a group and set our goals 
for the TSI plan. So throughout the presentation, you're going to see slides with lots of different colors. So I want to explain the two different types of scores that we looked at and what the colors mean. So there are two different types of scores, achievement and growth. There can be achievement without growth. There can be growth without meeting achievement benchmarks. Of course, we want all our students to meet those achievement benchmarks, but we're even more concerned that we're growing our students at at least a year's worth of growth in a year's worth of time. We prefer to exceed those growth predictions when at all possible, of course. The colors, this is just a generic slide. The colors on the slide indicate different things. Green is, is a color that indicates on target. So that means that students have grown a year's worth of growth in a year's worth of time. That's the goal. However, like I said, we do want to exceed those growth targets. So the blue colors, light blue and dark blue, means that we've exceeded. Anytime you see a color like that, that means we've exceeded the growth targets that the state predicts. <clears throat> so the state has a calculation based on old data from previous years. And so they make a prediction as to what the student should achieve and how much they should grow in a year. So it's a calculation. Um, the yellow and the red colors mean that the students fell below their year's worth of growth target. So you'll see these colors throughout the presentation and we'll explain them as they go as well. So this slide uh, shows the three different keystone tests it, in order from left to right. It's the literature or English language arts test, the algebra test in the middle, and the biology test on the right. The colors in the heading of the boxes um, tell you the level or what designation it is. These are achievement scores. And these are kind of difficult to understand because a lot of things factor into these. Um, so these are achievement scores. They are banked scores. These are scores for students that um, students can take the Keystone exam as many times as they'd like before the end of their junior year. Um, so the best score is reported as the achievement score for this group of juniors. So these scores are this year's seniors, last year's juniors. So a few things factor into these scores. You can see that the literature is in green. That means they hit the target, the achievement target. These are all achievement scores. Um, the middle algebra test is in red, and then the biology test is also in red. Um, on this slide, you will see the state average. You'll see our average of proficient or advanced um, on the first bar graph in each box. The state average is the second box. And then the goal for 2033 is the third bar graph within the box. Um, and you can see that for all three exams, literature, algebra, and biology. So literature exceeded the state average. Algebra did not. And biology just exceeded the state average. So usually these scores include our high performing middle school students. So um, our middle school students often take algebra in middle school. But due to COVID, many of these students did not test in the spring of 2020, and some even didn't test in the spring of 2021. Our current seniors were freshmen in 2021 and eighth graders in 2020. So the ALG1 test takers in middle schools, which tend to be pretty strong students, did not take the algebra keystones, and our honors biology students did not take their biology keystone. So in addition to students not taking these tests due to COVID exemptions, what was called non-numeric proficient, um, also in the fall of 2020, Emmaus High School changed their schedule, their master schedule, to a semester block. And some of the students were still on hybrid or remote um, remote learning during this time as well. So there are a lot of things that factor into these scores. This, all of them combined, may have impacted performance on the Keystone exams, specifically for honors biology and for algebra. Um, also, Emmaus High School, until last year, did not require some of our strongest students to retest or to test even once due to the uh, COVID exemptions, which are called the non-numeric proficient. So because we didn't require or force the retesting, um, the state assigned what is called an NMP or non-numeric non proficient score. And then the last thing that I want to note about the achievement test is in this time frame, Act 158 also came into play. These are the graduation pathway options. So because 
the uh, previously students had to pass the keystone in order for them to meet graduation requirements. Once Act 158 took took an effect, um, there's less of a need and less of an urgency for a student to become proficient on the keystone exams. So a little bit less of an incentive for our, our students who may have been on the bubble to actually retest. Oh, one thing I do want to add, I'm sorry, back to the achievement scores. And this actually is really important. For schools that exceed 95% participation rate taking the test, at least 95% of the students who should have taken the test took the test, um, those students or that school will be scored based on the scores that the students receive. However, where participation rates fall below 95%, each subsequent non-tested student must be designated as non-proficient. So basically, 95% attendance and participation on the Keystone is pretty critical because if it falls, if the school falls below that 95% uh, testing rate, the students who don't test are considered non-proficient. Whereas if it's 95% or above, the students who do not test are just not calculated in. So attendance is really critical. Okay, now this is a growth score. The, the boxes look the same. They don't have the yellow bar graphs in them, but they're in the same order. So literature is on the left, algebra is in the middle, biology is on the right. Now growth is a different group of students. You're not comparing the, the kids that were on the last slide are last year's juniors, this year's seniors. These students are students who actually took the test last year, regardless of what grade they're in. Growth is a different group of students. The PVOS growth scores are based on students who took the test last year. Their growth is a calculated score that compares the score they earned versus the score that the state predicted them to earn. The growth score is a calculation ranging from 50 to 100 that determines if the student grew at least a year's worth of growth in a year's worth of time. So you can see we have two boxes, two tests that are in the blue here, our literature, uh, students, the students who took the literature exam last year, um, the growth score was 100. That's not a percentage. That doesn't mean 100% of the kids grew exactly, but that's the calculated score from the state. <clears throat> On the right-hand side, there's another blue box, which is the biology group. And you can see that even though in the achievement was red, and again, a different group of kids, last year's biology students far exceeded their growth predictions. They grew significantly more than they were predicted to grow and significantly more than a year's worth of growth in a year's worth of time. The middle box is our algebra, and you can see that that is still in the red. Okay, so we're gonna start with some strengths here. Um, some good news. The um, the growth for the, this is a, this is a, a slide that kind of highlights some good stuff here. PVOS growth in biology and literature exceeded the state predictions, as I said. Um, ELA literature met the achievement expectations by Keystone data and biology achievement exceeded state averages and all subgroups showed improvement. So these two graphs right here show that in two different ways. The graph on the left-hand side is the bar graph, the green line that goes horizontally across. That is the growth goal. And you can see that um, on the left graph, the green bars are for um, the literature test, the maroon bars are for the biology, and the purple bars are for the algebra. And it's broken down into five quintiles or five achievement groups. Um, the literature scores met the growth standards for the majority of the five achievement quintiles. Both literature and biology far exceeded the growth predictions for the students who took the exams last year. And you will see that even though biology did not meet the achievement standards, the students grew significantly more than they were predicted to grow. The graph on the right is just those different colors that I showed you at the start of the data presentation. And you can see some good stuff there. Um, both biology and literature are in the dark blue. Some other things I'd like to highlight, some other strengths I'd like to highlight. Growth and achievement are on the rise in literature and keystone exams 
Um, both achievement will always be on the left, the graph for achievement will always be on the left, and growth will but always be on the right. And these are group, uh, these are graphs from the state, and they are broken down also by subgroup, and it shows the state averages as well. The state average is like the dotted line. So these graphs break down the various scores by subgroup. You will see these graphs periodically through the presentation. You will note that not all subgroups are found in every graph. This is due to the minimum number of students in each subgroup varies from year to year. The breaks in the graph are due to the COVID non-testing years where scores were not recorded since testing did not occur. The left graph shows achievement, and this is the percent of students meeting proficiency, proficient or advanced on the literature keystone, and this is on the rise even from since COVID. The graph on the right is the growth graph, and this graph shows that the percentage of students meeting their growth predictions on the literature keystone last year's students um, is also on the rise since COVID years as well. <clears throat> So this slide is set up the same way, but this is for algebra. All subgroups show the same thing. Unfortunately, declining scores and not meeting growth. Achievement, again, is on the left. You can see a significant decrease in the proficiency or passing rates of our students since 2021. Growth is on the right. You can also see here that our students are not meeting their growth predictions in algebra since 2021. Now this graph is for, or this slide is for all students. We found, you'll see between this slide and the next slide, that we found similar trends between all students and looking at the subgroup of, of students with IEPs. And so this slide shows all students. <clears throat> um, please note that the data includes, includes our retesters who have taken additional math classes uh, before retesting again. And clearly, we're not growing a lot of our students who are in the middle performing groups. So if you look at that bar graph on the left-hand side, the purple bars, um, it, again, the students are broken down into five achievement quintiles, five groups, based on their achievement. But the bar graph is actually showing growth. Our lowest quintile and our highest quintile are showing growth in the school. But our middle groups are, are obviously below the green line, and we are not growing those groups. They're soft in the middle. Um, the bottom right-hand graph shows you the same thing, but just with colors. You can see the light blue on either end of the five quintiles, and then the yellow in the middle. The graph on the top-hand right is for algebra, and it shows all of our subgroups, um, as reported by the state. Um, even the subgroups that are in green, that have green arrows, that means they hit the growth targets, but they're on the decline from previous years. That's why the arrows are going down, even if they're green. <clears throat> this is a slide that is just students with IEPs. And you can see a similar trend. Um, again, the, uh, let's see. It's broken up into the five quintiles for algebra. And this is, again, a growth chart using the five achievement quintiles. Clearly, we're not growing a lot of the students who are in the middle performing groups here as well. Um, there's no number for the highest quintile since there were not enough students in that highest quintile to generate a growth score. And remember, the growth score is calculated from 50, 50 to 100. It's not a straight percentage. And then the, the uh, graph in the bottom, the colors as well, you can see um, a, just a different representation of the same data. Okay, so these are our most recent screener results. So we're moving away from Keystone exams for a moment. You can see that 32% of our students are below benchmark. We're concerned about this, and reading is definitely a skill that all students must master. I do want to caution, and this is just anecdotal, we do believe that some of our students are not taking these screeners as seriously as we would like them to. So some of this data may be misleading, and we're, we discussed a lot in our meetings how we can incentivize and how we can um, get our students to really take these things seriously. However, teachers are reporting that in some classes, reading is still really truly a concern and a barrier. We must address this deficit where accurate and incentivize the effort on our screeners so we're working with clean, good data. The next two slides are about attendance. And again, this is state data. We cannot teach or help students that don't come to school. 
We would love them all to come to school every day. This slide shows the declining attendance from the 18-19 school year to the 22-23 school year. The first line is the statewide average, and then the second line is Emmaus High School. Um, the Emmaus average started at 89% attendance in 18-19 and dropped to 80.5% attendance, percent attendance last year. That approximately 9% drop over the five years out of approximately 2,800 students equates to around 250 students not attending school regularly. So that causes a serious impact on achievement. Just so you know, attendance by the state is defined as um, the percentage of students enrolled in school for 90 or more school days and present 90% of the time, 90% or more of the time. And one thing to note, attendance is a lagging indicator, which means when it's calculated into our Future Ready Index score, it's actually from the previous year. And I'll show this on another slide as well. Um, this is our attendance just broken down. Again, the top line is the statewide average. The second line is overall for Emmaus High School. And then the subgroups are broken out for the last five years. Uh, this is just another way to look at attendance. These are the same graphs from the state, so I just wanted to include these as well for attendance. Um, it, the, again, attendance is a lagging indicator, which means that the calculation uses the 21-22 school year information in the TSI designation, which is one year prior to the other, the other data and the other reporting um, period. So as you can see, a tremendous amount of data was analyzed um, by our teams, and we have come up with the most notable observations and patterns um, as a team. And in addition to the PVAS growth and Keystone achievement data, our TSI group reviewed our current screener data that Mrs. Gariello also reviewed to inform our discussions and planning. You will note that reading emerged as a significant concern for students who are struggling across the board. Unlike in elementary school where students are learning to read, unlike uh, excuse me, and in the secondary level, especially at the high school, we are reading to learn and in all subject areas. So what we basically came up as a committee is that it is imperative that we have identified reading as a primary and leverage point for the planning of our TSI plan. And obviously it's a necessary competency for success in any of all and all academic areas. Also to note on this slide, we do recognize that all students do not have the same access across the board as support, uh, as our LCTI students, especially our half-day students who attend LCTI. Um, Mrs. Gariello mentioned the middle group of students is underperforming across the board on our Keystone exams, and therefore we're going to target them in additional supports, as well as attendance and parent engagement are some of our goals. This slide basically just um, indicates a lot of the priority challenges that we came up with as a team. So we summarized the most pressing issues after reviewing everything. And as you know, there's significantly more data that is in the TSI report and that was included in this presentation. And after many meetings and many discussions, uh, there, there are four priorities that emerged and goals were created to improve the outcomes of these four areas. So that leads us to the targeted goals. Um, I will speak first to the, to the first two goals. Um, these are all four as basically a summary slide. So we took the four areas. Um, first and foremost, priority number one, all students should be reading close to or above grade level. And priority two, all students must have foundational math skills prior to the algebra keystone. Uh, we created SMART goals to address these concerns. And our counselors, our teachers from nearly every discipline um, and department, our central office administrators, and our building administrators work together uh, to create these goals. Uh, there has been input from our department chairs, our un union representatives, students, and parents as well. I'm going to go into the first goal, um, which basically covers what I just mentioned uh, as far as reading. So students will demonstrate 10% growth in reading scores from September to May is our, one of our goals. We also um, plan to implement keys of literacy and increase reading seminar options for students. Using the A-READ screening data, we will monitor growth in the reading areas and their scores for every student at the high school. 
we will screen them, we have screened them twice, we will screen them three times and build in incentives yet to be determined uh, so that we are confident that the students are giving these screeners their very best shot. Keys to literacy, uh, this is a six year rollout of a very deliber deliberate and thoughtful professional development plan and implementation of keys to literacy for all teachers. So this focuses on reading comprehension, uh, vocabulary, fluency, and writing skills. Uh, this is not a new curriculum, but rather an approach to be to use as literacy skills in the classroom across the curriculum and uh, within all the disciplines. This should only enhance the quality of our instruction across the board in every content area and including math. Our math teachers who were on this committee felt strongly and strongly believe that some of the deficits that we're seeing is not entirely the fact that students don't know how to do math content, but rather they encounter challenging uh, challenges, I should say, deciphering uh, the problems themselves. So there are three cohorts as far as um, the keys to literacy. We were going to start first with humanities, and then electives, and then STEM. And each cohort will have three years of professional development and coaching throughout this process. As far as the reading seminar, this is a course that we currently offer. We just plan to increase the number of students who will have access to our reading seminar classes and students will be placed in these classes using their data, and if their scores uh, demonstrate proficiency, they'll be able to um, come out of that class. And goal number two, so we plan to implement a new foundational math course, incentivize uh, screeners, as well as keystone prep sessions. So I'll break that down one by one. The foundations math course, uh, this course is something that will reinforce foundational math concepts needed for success in fundamentals of algebra and algebra one. Uh, students are placed into this course based on individual data, teacher recommendation, and data based on their three to eight performance on state standardized testing. Through ongoing data collection, students will receive instruction designed to challenge them based on their needs to provide, based on their needs to provide remediation and or enrichment. The topics will include arithmetic operations, number system, fractions, math facts, ratios, proportions, expressions, exponents, basic geometry, statistics, probability, graphing coordinates, and deciphering word problems. Again, back to literacy. The focus is on learning the conceptual understandings of mathematical processes and basic computational procedures. So we hope to have, within our master schedule, two sections of this course that will run at the high school next year but we will always have transfer students who have not necessarily gone through our entire program, so we recognize that we may need to continue at least one section um, moving forward. And then the Keystone prep sessions, we would plan to run those during Hernet Homeroom, so we're already starting this now. We're not waiting till next year for this. Uh, this is similar to what we already offer as SAT prep sessions during our Hornet Homeroom period once a week. So Keystone prep sessions would be filled with students recommended by their Algebra One teachers, and there's no grade associated with this particular course uh, or work, but this is also just a remediation and practice and support. Okay, the third goal is to provide additional supports. So by the end of the 24-25 school year, the number of students participating in peer tutoring, uh, which would include National Honor Society tutoring, study hall peer tutoring services, will increase by 100%. We want to double our numbers um, compared to this school year, just using the National Honor Society tutoring data alone. Um, we would like to expand this during homeroom and a newly designated tutoring room where students tutor other students during um, study halls, but it would happen throughout the day, not just during homeroom. We're also looking into an after-school homework help. We're trying to figure out if we can um, work to include faculty, teachers after school. And we're also looking to reward the students who take on the, the tutoring. Just like our mentors here this evening, they are volunteering their time. We would like to reward them and thank them for their efforts. Um, let's see. So we are talking about calling it peer academic tutoring. And then the fourth goal is to create and implement six, six monthly parent workshops. So compared to parent-teacher conferences, the number of family members attending these sessions would increase. Our goal is 10%, but hopefully more than that um, compared to this school year. So topics covered could be um, 
wide ranging from attendance, welcome to Emmaus High School, literacy strategies, math homework help, study skills, executive functioning skills, how to use technology at the high school, profile of a graduate and soft skills for life after high school, and so much more. Um, we would like to use the time where the teachers would have had uh, parent-teacher conferences and bring teachers in in evenings throughout the school year and everyone would still have to put in the same amount of time, but it would just be spread out for different topics. We would include incentives for the families, like food, babysitting for younger siblings, um, combining with other events, maybe sporting events, or awards, or other things happening at the school, um, in order to encourage participation. So basically, the parent-teacher conferences would shift to content area conference nights, STEM, Humanities Special Nights. We would survey the community to see what needs they have and address those at the evening sessions and incentivize attendance for the families. Um, we could invite current students to showcase their work. And if teachers are not presenting to the families, they could also be providing tutoring to students. So when their parents come to these sessions, the high schoolers could also come and receive tutoring um, from other teachers who would be available. We also want to change our monthly newsletters. Uh, the newsletters that we send out really are just information, um, links and information, but we would like to also include how-tos in the newsletters, letters, how to check grades and attendance, how to contact teachers, how to support with homework, um, how to assist students in getting help at school, um, how to join a club or a sport. So we're looking at um, teaching the parents how to do that as well. So those are our four goals. I know there's a lot more information in the actual plan. I think it's 70 or 71 pages, but we wanted to pull out the most important information for this evening um, that kind of explains how we got to the goals that we did. Questions? <laughs> All right. Uh, well, thank you very much for that detailed presentation and, 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 and uh, pulling the most salient details in order to, to uh, you know, facilitate a conversation. So I'd like, I'd like to open up questions to the board. Ms. Bowman? Yeah, um, I have a, a bunch of popcorn questions, uh, pretty extensive presentation. So um, hopefully they're, good. they're not really in a logical order. But um, <laughs> the group of people in the very beginning of the presentation that you said uh, yes. were on the committee, I, I, I thought it was wonderful that you included um, so many educators and also students. I thought, I thought that was great. Um, it's a little. I'm not even sure why I'm making this comment because it's not like you can go back to, in time and change this. But I, I think given the nature of the TSI and the nature of the students who are struggling, it would have been nice to see some parents of kids who um, are in special education uh, on that committee so that they could offer some input um, and maybe some even some information about like um, why. I think it would be helpful for the school to look into things like why do um, parents of kids with 504s and IEPs struggle with attendance um, rather than, um, I've brought this up before, but when we say we're reaching out to parents and we're just telling them to send their kids to school, I, I don't really think that that works. We've shown over years that sending them mean letters doesn't seem to get their kids to school. So uh, the more that we can engage these families and find out what's actually going on, and then um, offering support rather than reprimands, I think, is important. Um, and we actually, yeah. with the parents who met on uh, with us, we actually talked about targeting and inviting specific families to these evening events um, not, and opening it up to everybody, but sending very specific invites. Um, so we hopefully can target this, the people who need to hear some of the information. That's, that's good. That's good. Mm -hmm. um, there were some just points of clarification. Sure. When you when you said the parent workshop, are are you looking to teach parents math so they can help their kids at home with math, or like what exactly is that? It could be any. It really could be open. We'd like to survey the community and see what they need. Um, the teachers on the committee and the administrators on the committee came up with a list of ideas that we think would help parents at home. That could be one of them. Um, how to how to sit and how to well, not navigate Schoology and access the material, but then also how to help with the homework itself, help with the content, whether it's math <clears throat> or reading or, or any, anything else. Um, so it could be help with the tools, but it also could be giving parents 
instruction on how to actually help with homework as well. Okay. Um, this is more of a overall comment, mostly for the administration, but I would like to see something like that happening earlier in a child's school career. I, I think parents, I, I know I was not able to help my son with homework probably around fourth or fifth grade, so math homework specifically. <laughs> um, I think by the time they're in high school, you've had many years of parents going, I, I don't know what this is. And you know, maybe you can pull them back in, but um, okay. And then I, I just had a question about the literacy aspect because it's not sh really jiving with the test results. When you said that they're struggling to understand word problems, mm -hmm. but then we look at the English language arts, which is like doing great, and, it, and that's kind of showing that, I mean, I think that test involves a lot of reading, and they seem to it be sure doing does. well on it. So where, where is, can you help me understand that disconnect? Absolutely. So um, the teachers, and we talked extensively about this, uh, students seem to be able to navigate the literature keystone test, but then applying those same literacy skills outside of that literature test to a math test, to a biology test. Um, I'm a former biology teacher. That biology test is one heck of a reading test. They might be able to understand the concepts and maybe verbalize the concepts in class and answer questions, but reading the scenarios, looking at all the graphs, putting the words and the numbers and the pictures together, and then answering the question, it takes a lot of literacy skills. Yeah. And so that's why we want to embed more literacy skills within the content. Um, the math test as well, some of them are just all number questions. <clears throat> excuse me, but some of them are long word problems that they have to decipher. And so students who struggle in reading will have a problem with that, even if they understand the algebraic concepts yeah. and what to do once they decipher the problem. Okay, okay. So that's what that's for. I, so everything that you're about to put into place is going to help a cohort that isn't the cohort that tested that gave us these scores. And I, I guess I do worry about those kids because we've seen them come up through LMMS and now they're in the high school. Um, and they're not the kids who are actually going to be helped by this. They're, they're graduating. Is that correct? So yes and no. So the achievement scores are our current seniors. So they are graduating this year. Um, but the students who are in, in, included in those growth scores, they're with us right now. Okay. So many of them were ninth graders last year or even 10th graders for biology, um, but they're still with us and they'll still be with us for a few more years. So we can still make a pretty significant impact. Okay, okay. I, I would expect that our math scores magically change next year um, as a result of none of the things that we're doing right now. And, and I say that because when you mentioned your, sorry, what, I'm trying to think of when the advanced people take algebra. Is it seventh grade? Seventh so you had your eighth. seventh and eighth graders <laughs> who opted out of the test during COVID times. And those were your ad advanced and high proficient students who didn't take it. And so then all that was left was um, the students who um, are either proficient or below proficient uh, generally to take that test. And so your numbers are low. Next year, you're not going to have that. The number, the testing scores are going to automatically increase regardless of what we do. Um, how are you going to measure whether any of this is working because the data is dirty? Well, the, the baseline, that the SMART goals that we put together are, is based on real data. The Keystone scores are a little trickier, and that's why we did not base our SMART goals on, okay. on that. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. That, that's good. Um, you mentioned the 95%. Mm -hmm. um, are we above or below that? We've been below that, just slightly below. Okay. So that kind of dings us as well. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. We're working hard this year. We have a lot of students testing um, and retesting. So we have a lot of kids taking the keystones this year. Okay. And then the screeners that you mentioned, mm -hmm. they're a reading test? So there's a math, te a math screener. We do okay. math on one day and reading on another day. Okay. Yep. And they're missing instruction time to take those? 
Kind of, not really. So we do an altered schedule on those days and we extend homeroom because we want to make sure our LCTI kiddos um, can have enough time to take the test. So we extend homeroom, which is in the middle of the day, forces us to shorten the block one and block two <clears throat> on a one A day and one B day to from like 83 minute classes to 62 minute classes um, for those two days. Third block doesn't get shortened because of lunch and then fourth block um, because it's homeroom's over, already over and those stay the same. Okay, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the last thing is more of a comment. Um, I don't really have any problems with the plan. I, I like the classes, that, that comes a little later, but, mm -hmm. that, but that you're suggesting and um, many of the things that you're putting in place seem like great things to do. I do have a little bit of an issue that this is presented and being voted on the same night. Um, the plan is 77 pages long. Um, it's a lot to digest. Even this presentation was a lot to digest. The way that we do public comment, it's only at the beginning of the meeting. So if anybody out there is listening and has a comment, they won't really have the opportunity to make it. Um, is there a reason that we have to vote on it tonight? Um, we put the plan and the presentation together because of the fact that the, we have a team comprised of students, administrators, parents, and teachers who have analyzed the data and have really done um, a significant amount of work to identify root causes and to put strategies in place. And so it really was about the two going together in terms of this is the body of work that's now happened over the course of a month and a half. And this is the plan that the team that's ultimately going to have to implement that plan and is responsible for this is the plan that they're reckoning. So we thought packaging them together. But in terms of like a, a deadline to the state, no, that I mean, that was where it really was about cohesion of the process. And, and those who ultimately have responsibility being the ones who develop the plan. So if we tabled this tonight so that we actually vote on it the next meeting, which allows for public comment to happen on this plan, uh, regardless of whether somebody actually comments, I, I just feel like it's important to give people the chance to, is that going to put you behind schedule? No. I mean, I would like, obviously, we would like the board's approval so we can move forward as soon as possible. So the longer we wait, the longer we wait. Um, but in terms of submitting to the state, no. Okay. And, and in terms of the state, no. And I'll also add, um, just to go back to the opening comments, there was, I'm going to say, some intentional design in terms of hearing about a proposed math course and then a curriculum presentation, approval of a curriculum, and ultimately an addendum to the program of studies, which, as you know, the, the, we are literally on the cusp of um, <laughs> students doing course selection. And so I see. there was a, a pack, there, there was intention yeah. and, it, you know, like a, a package of decisions, I'll say. Okay. Uh, I'll yield the floor and maybe come back. <laughs> okay. well, Mr. Smith. All right. Thank you. Um, and, and I'm going to start my, my comments by uh, prefacing and saying this may be a little unfair, but I think a lot of the people in the room are probably thinking what I'm about to say and, and that when we're talking about TSI, it's three letters, but TSI is TSI. And so we recently just exited LMMS out of TSI after being in it for only a year. And I remember my comments that I made back then um, where it felt like that TSI plan and the reasons for being in TSI were very much different than this plan. Um, then it felt like a lot of the reasons for the designation had already been identified and planned for uh, deliberately and, 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 and such that by the time the TSI designa designation ran, uh, came around, it felt like it wasn't a surprise to really anybody in the room. Not that this feels like a surprise to anybody in the room, but I think that the um, the plan you have laid out here feels like a bigger undertaking um, than that TSI plan. And I, m my concern is that, one of my concerns is that um, the 
work that was done at LMS and, and moving them out of TSI after only a year is going to be the baseline expectation for moving out of TSI. I don't think this is something that's going to take a year. I think it's something that's going to take, I don't know, mm -hmm. but um, to plan as it's laid out, I see um, a lot of piece that were all the goals are all, all new, new ac action steps that um, we're, we're going to be discussing the, the largest of which is probably um, a, a new course. Um, so I, I just want to make sure we're kind of going into this with a mindset that while it might have the same three letters and the same um, PDE process and submitting it, the, the two plans in my mind cannot be any um, more different. Um, I appreciate you recognizing that. Sure. Yeah. The uh, a couple of uh, questions that I had going, um, my colleague uh, asked about screeners. Are these screeners that we're using, are they predictive or um, in alignment with students' performance on standardized assessments, Keystone specifically? I don't think they're predictive to the Keystones. I don't, they're... they're nationally normed. It's A reading and A math. Mm -hmm. They are not aligned to the Keystone. It's not like a CDT, right. um, like the state puts out, that's very aligned to the Keystone. So no. Right. Is there, are there screeners that we know of that would be more predictive of students' performance on those Keystones that we could explore? Not, I wouldn't want to add more. But if there is a better option that gives us a better educated guess as to how students might perform on our keystones. There may be lots of them, but the one that I'm most familiar with are the classroom diagnostic tools, the CDTs. Um, they are aligned to the keystones. Um, some districts use them, some districts don't. Um, but they give different, that's specifically for that test as opposed to reading in general, math skills in general. Right. They're, they're different. Right. Um, you made a, a, a point in there. Um, students are uh, concerned that you might not the I mean, seriously, uh, seriously. While I appreciate, say also the students that were, working, and I think that particular is unique to us. And that's Agreed. Pretty where uh, the last the last just I guess observation um, that I had in looking through goals was. A lot of you are uh, the plan as action items are um, a responsibility of administration. It's not just all from a group of people within it. It's a a full side which where um, involving parents to leading Hornet home sports and at PD, obviously curricular departments of the math. math I have a huge set. A lot of those um, things at implement require time uh, backs at work buildings mm -hmm. that think we recognize uh, that that is in order to make this kind of growth in this movement is going to require time. Um, it's going to need to be planned for. It's going to need to be uh, when folks are working at time, what it looks like be um, deliberately instead of that. Being, um, I think important because of that efficient use of whatever that might look uh, A lot of goals, a lot of the, yeah, we have set out here is going to to Absolutely. So keep, you know, about it. Absolutely. Always on the forefront. One thing that you just remember, I do want to brag about that a little bit here, um, but um, <laughs> at the start of the school year, realize that we saw one uh, requirements this year has to do, which is basically a, an academic teacher must create one each. Um, this year in August, heard each teacher of what department, was the art department or the English department or science, to create a goal that was aligned to either a keystone literacy skill or a keystone algebra skill. And I have to say the teachers have really stepped up. Um, the goals and the slows that we've seen each teacher build into their classes really is giving every student in every class reinforcement, practice, and feedback on algebra keystone skills or literacy keystone skills. And I have to believe, and the teachers really have taken this quite seriously and done a really remarkable job, I have to believe that if a student is taking six classes and they have practice with algebra skills or literacy skills in every single one of their classes um, where they're baselined, they're giving three practice, and then they're um, given an assessment at the end that they're going to also improve. So this was in place even before 
the TSI designation, the recognition that we needed to reinforce these skills. Um, and then just the last thought I had was just to uh, add on to uh, Ms. Bowman's um, 